Elizabeth McCourt Tabor, known as Baby Doe, was the second wife of pioneer Colorado businessman Horace Tabor. Born in 1854, she died in 1935. Her rags to riches and back to rags story made her a well-known figure in her own day and inspired an opera and a Hollywood movie based on her life. She is also the subject of the novel The Silver Baron's Wife, written by my guest today, Donna Bear Stein. Born in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, Baby Doe moved to Colorado in the mid-1870s with her first husband, Harvey Doe, whom she divorced, a scandalous act in those days. She then moved to Leadville, Colorado, where she met and married Tabor, a wealthy silver magnate almost twice her age. Tabor divorced his first wife of 25 years to marry Baby Doe. He was then serving a brief stint as U.S. Senator. They moved back to Denver, but had to endure the hostility of the community, appalled by his divorce and remarriage. This was 1880. The Tabors lived lavishly until the repeal of the Sherman Silver Purchase Act caused the Panic of 1893. The panic caused widespread bankruptcies in silver-producing regions such as Colorado. Tabor died destitute, and Baby Doe moved back to Leadville with her two daughters, Lily and Silver Dollar. It's quite a story, and here to tell us more is the author of The Silver Baron's Wife, Donna Bear Stein. Donna is the author of award-winning Sympathetic People, and Sometimes You Sense the Difference. She's also the founder and publisher of Tiferet Journal. Her work appears in many journals, including the Virginia Quarterly Review, Confrontation, and Prairie Schooner. I'm Alice Bloom. This is A Town in Village 2. Welcome back. Donna, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Alice. Well, I learned so much that I didn't know. Um, first of all, I knew nothing of the Silver Standard or the Sherman Silver Act. Uh, did I say that right? The Sherman the, Silver Purchase Act. The Silver Purchase Act. Yes. I mean, we all know about the gold standard, mm -hmm. and we thought our money was tied to it, but there was mm -hmm. a time when our money was tied to a silver standard. That's right. The Sherman Silver Purchase Act was first enacted in 1890 at the behest of silver miners and farmers. Um, the country before that had been on a gold standard mm -hmm. according to the wishes of bankers and railroad men. When the Sherman Silver Purchase Act was enacted, it required our government to purchase, I think it was 4.5 million ounces of silver a month from silver miners. So this was a huge boon uh, to the silver mining industry and, and to Colorado in particular. Um, and the, polit the politicians of the day were very divided on whether we should be a, a country based on a gold standard or a silver standard. What happened in the three years that the, that the Silver Purchase Act was um, active is that silver prices went up and up and the inflation of silver led to the deflation of gold. So bankers and railroad men were quite unhappy with what had happened. And when there was a Wall Street panic in 1893, um, the price of silver, the price of everything dropped dramatically. And uh, President Grover Cleveland enacted the repeal. And that led to Horace Tabor's uh, loss of his fortune. Loss of every, but loss not only every, his. Not, not only his, but many, many people, yes. Wow. But this is really only a brief time, three years. That's right. That the That's silver right. standard was in effect. Yes. And what were the forces? Was it just because the gold the gold miners had more leverage? That yes, they, um, um, they did. And also, again, because, because the gold standard was leading to the, I mean, because the silver standard that had been enacted led to gold being devalued. And I don't, I, I'm not an expert on the economics of it, but somehow um, the country was, many people in the country were worried that their gold standard, that the gold that the country owned would, would lose its value too. So that's why they switched back to making gold the standard. Wow. So how many people really lost everything in this panic? Oh, I don't know numbers. Um, uh, I don't know numbers. But it was a devastating yes. experience. Yes, yes, and the whole, sure. I mean, and separate from the repeal, the, per, the Purchase Act repeal actually was a result of the panic that happened before, the Wall Street panic in, in 1893 happened before the Act was repealed. The repeal of the Act was um, set forward in order to correct the economy. I see. 
Yes. Well, there's so much to talk about. One, Leadville sounded like, I hate to sound like a provincial New Yorker, but podunk. Um, and apparently it was the site of a lot of life and livelihood yes. in Colorado. It's an incredible town. I first went there when I was seven years old, and I've been back many times since. And I highly recommend that if anyone watching or you, Alice, are in Colorado that you go. It's the highest incorporated town in the United States. Highest as far as height? Yes. Okay. 10,200 square feet above, I mean, 10,200 feet above sea level. Okay. Um, the people who live there include the best known outlaws of the Wild <laughs> West. Uh, Doc Holliday dealt Pharaoh, a card game at a monarch saloon in, in Leadville. The James brothers went through um, the Tabor Opera House, which is being remodeled right now, uh, the Tabor Opera House was built by Horace Tabor. It saw the likes of Sarah Bernhardt, um, Philip, John Philip Sousa, Oscar Wilde performed on the stage. And actually, after his performance, he went down to the bottom of the matchless mine with Horace Tabor and drank uh, absinthe and whiskey. Um, and he wrote quite a bit about his time in Leadville, Oscar Wilde did. The other people that I, that I mentioned, um, there were many people who made the, their fortune in Leadville. David May, who established the May department store chain, mm -hmm. um, they owned Bloomingdale's and many other department stores. Um, Solomon Guggenheim made his silver fortune there in Leadville. A lot of a lot of large family wealth came from that boom period in silver mining in Colorado. Well, as we were talking before, not only that, but I, in my research, I found that Fred Trump, the grandfather yes. of Donald Trump, started his career in mining. It wasn't in Leadville. Is that I think, Alaska? I think it was in Alaska. Okay. Okay. But at about the same time, okay. he made his fortune also in mining. Okay. So, yeah. Who knew? Was, yeah. Who knew? Now, there's so much to talk about. I love historical fiction. One, because you get involved in a story that's accurate, pretty accurate. Yes. Although, I mean, I'm sure you made up dialogue and yes. you know, things like that that right. just is not commemorated. But you learn about history and, and, and parts of our country that we never knew about. Now, we've talked about how similar some of the political situations are. Yes in Leadville at this time, in the 1890s, as they are today. Mm -hmm. Draw some of those similarities. Um, just a little bit. The, the Republicans and the Democrats were very divided. Uh, Horace Tabor was a Republican, and as you mentioned in the introduction, he did serve um, a short term as U.S. Senator. He was filling out a term for another senator from Colorado who had died. Um, and the Republicans and Democrats pretty much divided along the lines of the silver versus gold debate. Um, Tabor also, he married Lizzie Tabor when he was serving his term in Washington, D.C. They married at the Willard Hotel uh, in Washington, and the president, president at the time, Chester Arthur, came to their wedding, um, and President Arthur's cabinet members came, but none of the cabinet members' wives came, because as you mentioned, this was a sordid affair. Both parties both Horace and Lizzie were divorcees, and uh, the wives looked down on that, so they, were they shunned her. Yes, yes. And that happened both in Washington, which was probably a little yes. more sophisticated, yes. and when they moved back to Denver. Yes, she was shunned by Denver society as well. There was a group called the Denver Elite. I think it was the Denver 30, um, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the wealthy people of, of Denver did not Accept Lizzie in because Lizzie she was or seen, Baby Doe or Baby Doe, right? That was she got name. the name Baby Doe from the miners. She first went down into the silver mines with her first husband Harvey Doe. She had moved from Oshkosh to um, California Gulch in Colorado, and mined, which was really she was a woman who really bucked social expectations. Women were not allowed down in the mines at the time. In fact. It was considered very bad luck for a man to see a woman before he went down into the mine for his work day. So the fact that she did that is quite astounding. Um, one of, she was only five foot tall, violet eyes, um, and blonde curls, and uh, the miners nicknamed her Baby Doe. Okay. Now, she must have been an extraordinarily charismatic person. Yes. Because 
her accomplishments are she tried to go down into the mines, which mm -hmm. she didn't, I mean, her husband didn't let her, or he she went to, want, he, didn't he, want, he didn't want her to, right. But he was getting addicted to opium and drinking too much and going to see prostitutes, and he kind of fell, he didn't um, step up to the plate as far as their work. But I guess one of the things that was so intriguing about her, but she was either loved and hated for, was she didn't put up with it. That's right. That's right. She was a very right. strong-minded woman, um, even though she was petite physically. Um, as I said, she bucked social expectations right. in working in the mine. She bucked social expectations in having an affair with Horace, who was 35 years her senior. Um, twice her age. Twice yeah. her age, yeah. And um, and then the last 35 years of her life, which to me were were fascinating, um, and one of the reasons I first got interested in her, she spent the last 35 years of her life living at the Matchless Mine after Horace had died and after he had lost his fortune. She and moved back. The Matchless Mine was in where in, in Leadville. Leadville. It's right outside of Leadville on Friars Hill. And if I can back up just a little bit, when when the Sherman Silver Purchase Act was repealed, most people assumed that Lizzie would leave Horace. Most people assumed that she had been a, a gold digger, or in this case, a, a silver, silver digger, 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 right? And that she had married him for his money. I personally don't believe that, reading their letters and other things about them, and the fact that she remained with him for six years after he died. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sorry, after he, he lost, lost his money, right? And they lived, um, they had to sell this villa, a square block villa in Denver that Horace had built for Lizzie. They sold that and most of their belongings. She had a $90,000 necklace that she had worn Which at her wedding. Which today's value was probably much more than that. Yes. Now, when they married, he was worth $24 million at, in 1883, which would translate to about half a billion in today's currency. Um, so she remained with him after he lost his fortune. He had to work as a day laborer for $3 a day. He was in his 60s. And then, through a friend of his, he was given the position of postmaster in Denver. So he worked in the very building that he had built with his money earlier in his life. So, And then when he died, she took the legend is that his dying words to her were, hang on to the matchless mind, it'll make millions again. We don't know historically whether he actually said that or not. Okay. And did it? She, it did not. Okay. She did go back to Leadville, though, with her two daughters and lived in this one-room shack at the Matchless Mine until her death in 1935. And she lived as a recluse. She lived as a recluse. Um, she wrote down thousands of her dreams. Now, Freud's Interpretations of Dreams was published, the book was published in, I believe, 1898. I don't know if she read it, but I certainly am fairly certain that there were not a lot of people in the United States writing down their dreams at that time in the late 19th, early 20th century. I mean, psychoanalysis was starting to, to take hold in Europe, but people were, there weren't dream journals or dream groups like there are today, but right. there are thousands of pieces of paper with her dreams on them. Well, let's back up for a second because First of all, let's just be clear. Tabor didn't die of a broken heart. No, he, he died, he died of, of an ruptured appendix yes. that was misdiagnosed. I mean, doctor who said, "Oh, he'll get better. He'll get better. Don't we don't have to do anything." Anymore. Yes, and yeah. at the time, surgery for appendicitis was not common. No, so. and probably pretty dangerous as well. Yes. But nevertheless, nothing was done, and he died from infection. Yes. I guess of that. Yeah. So he didn't die because he was so broken hearted over losing his no. body. There was no. a certain resilience in their yes. uh, relationship and, and their ability. And it was clear that she, at least from your story, that he, she did stay with him for yes. better and for worse. Yes. She was going to do that. Now, as far as Freud, she, she seemed to embrace a kind of spirituality. Mm -hmm. um, the, you could see the nucleus of it early in her life. She did talk about her dreams, and she wrote down her dreams. Yes. But it, be, it, it kind of took over her psyche. Yes. And she was raised Catholic. Um, but the church excommunicated her when she divorced her first husband. So in my mind, she really, in some way, had to create her own sense of spirituality. I think she was definitely a believer. And in fact, uh, Jesus and Mary appeared in her dreams many times. 
um, and other spiritual figures and also other people from her family and the actress Lily Langtree, different, you know, all kinds of people appeared in her dreams. But she, um, uh, she, some people think she went crazy living in Leadville in the shack. Um, I was on book tour in Colorado in September mm -hmm. and some people were saying that recently they've been wondering if she had lead poisoning. Uh -huh. um, there's a woman, Judy Nolte Temple, who wrote a book called Mad Woman in the Cabin, The Life of Baby Doe Tabor, and she focuses a lot on um, Lizzie's dreams. And she showed them to theologians, some of whom think Lizzie was crazy and some of whom think she may have been a, an American female mystic. Huh. But she changed, I mean, because she wasn't in her early life a solitary person. No. She was very social. Yes. And in fact, um, she's beginning her exciting life with a new husband. Yes. And her first husband's family owned a mine. And remember, and he, I'm part telling owner. you, right, he was part owner of mine, but um, Lizzie and her husband were going to run the mine. Yes. It was her husband who copped out, and yeah. he just couldn't live up to it. But mm -hmm. she had the fortitude not only to run the mine, she wanted to be a miner. Yes. Um, and, of course, women didn't do that sort of thing. And as you said, they, was, they were prohibited from doing it. But she had the fortitude and the instincts to do it. And she was a social person. I mean, mm -hmm. she, it seemed like she did kind of descend into a kind of reclusivity that was not consistent with her earlier personality. Yes. So you, you I kind think of, she, I mean, she suffered a lot of losses in her life. I do yeah. think Hor Horace was the true love of her life. And when she had his death, and then she also lost both of her daughters. So. I, that was not clear to me. I, one daughter, well, one daughter, Lily, is the older one, and the younger one was Silver Dollar, which is just an adorable name. Right. You could understand why that happened. Um, but one moved to Chicago. To yeah. Oshkosh. Well, right. Silver Dollar moved, moved to, to Chicago, Chicago, and Lily moved back to Oshkosh to Lizzie's family. Now, I, did, I don't remember now, the one who moved to Chicago got involved in drugs and yes, she did. bad activities. She was a, she was a writer, mm -hmm. and um, she moved, she actually um, had worked for the Denver Post for a while, mm -hmm. and then wanted, she wrote a novel called Star of Blood, which her mother financed to have published, didn't really go anywhere. And then she moved to Chicago to be a newspaper reporter, but ended up getting in with a bad crowd, and uh, either she was probably murdered, people think she was, but Lizzie never admitted that her daughter had been murdered. She thought her daughter was in a convent. They, well, she never had confirmation that her daughter died. Well, it was in newspapers uh, of the time, okay. and people showed her the newspaper articles, but she wouldn't, wouldn't it? acknowledge And what happened it. to Silver Dollar? To, that was Silver Dollar. Oh, okay. Uh, Lily, Lily was embarrassed by her mother's reclusivity mm -hmm. or eccentricity and moved back to be with um, Liz, Lizzie's family, birth family oh, okay. in Oshkosh and ended up wear, marrying one of her cousins. Okay. And did she die as a young woman? No, no she, she did not. She but she did not have contact with her mother. Mm -hmm. So Lizzie had these ter three terrible losses and her, her parents were gone certainly by that time. Now, she, she died alone. alone in a cabin in the woods in the freezing cold yeah. lizard. It looked like she died just of exposure and well, she actually had a heart attack, but she mm -hmm. was she was found frozen, but mm -hmm. the cause of death was heart attack. Mm -hmm. I mean to, it, to see the descent from this vital young oh, woman yes. who lived rather aggressively. Yeah. And, and was beautiful. Uh, yeah. The pictures on the cover of the book, and this mm -hmm. is what first drew me when I first learned about Lizzie when I was 7 years old. I saw these photos. Uh, one of a woman in an, an ermine opera coat, beautiful young woman, and another of, a, of an older woman in men's clothing and a sloppy, floppy hat and holding a rifle standing in front of the shack. And I thought, how does this woman, how does one woman go from point A to point B? Um, and what's the continuing thread in her life? Wow. Now, you said you were in Leadville when you were seven years old. Yes. Was this just passing through, or did you we were, I grew up in the Midwest, and we always took family vacations to Colorado. So. Interesting. And what about Leadville resonated with you? It's a magical city. In fact, it's called Magic City or Cloud City. It was called that in the 19th century as well. When you, when you walk on the streets, if you look down, there, aren't, there, there are very few small houses, little, little kind of Victorian houses there. Um, and Harrison Street is the main 
street. Uh, the Tabor Opera House is there. Uh, uh, there are other old hotels. But you are so high up in the mountains that um, you feel like you're literally up in the clouds. If you mm -hmm. look down a street, at the end of the street, you will see clouds. Wow. Do you have trouble with the altitude? Yes. Um, uh -huh. one, on one of my research trips, I made the mistake of not spending a night in Denver. I flew to Denver and drove immediately to Leadville, and I, I was so, I was, I was uh, really overcome by by the height. Yeah. Because they talk about Denver being the mile high city, but this right. is clearly this is high. This is, yeah. Now, how did you come to the story of Baby Doe? Is she commemorated in town? I mean, there. Oh yes, oh, okay. and the, and Matchless Mine has tours there, uh -huh. and I'm thrilled to have met um, the woman uh, Brenda Miller dresses up as Baby Doe and leads tours at the Matchless Mine, and um, as I've mentioned, the Tabor Opera House is being renovated mm -hmm. now, so that's a big town project, um, uh, and no, no, she's very well known in town. Wow. How long did you spend writing this story? Uh, quite a few years. I was fascinated by her, as I said, when I was seven, and I researched her in the 1980s, but I didn't really start writing the novel um, until, I guess, 1995, and then I put it aside. It won an award, um, the Penn New England Discovery Award for an unpublished novel. Um, but I put it aside when we moved to New Jersey and started work on something else. And then I pulled it back out and mm -hmm. rewrote it several times. And, uh, so it feels very good to so, have it out right, finally you lived because with it's her been a, a passion time. project of mine, definitely. What are you working on now? I've started a new novel and I have a collection of short stories that are based on lithographs by Thomas Hart Benton, the Midwestern mm -hmm. painter. Um, I'm trying to find an agent for the collection of stories now, and I've started another historical novel, too. Oh, good. What, what period? Uh, it's uh, late 19th century again, and Sarah Bernhardt, who is a minor character in The Silver Baron's Wife, ends up being not the main character, but a much more important minor character in this new novel. That seems to be a period of, of time that intrigues you. It is, yes. And why is that? Um, just so much happened, and, and actually the seed for this new novel is a dinner that took place in 1896 in New York City, at, in, and in attendance at this dinner were Sarah Bernhardt, Nikola Tesla, Swami Vivekananda, who introduced yoga to the United States, and William James. Mm -hmm. Those four people, and I just started thinking, oh my gosh, to be a fly on the wall during that dinner. Now, a dinner conversation doesn't generally a novel make, so I've invented some other people and um, some other characters, and it's basically following Sarah Bernhardt. I have a maid following Sarah through her American tour in 1896. That sounds fascinating. When you write a historical novel, do you feel compelled to be accurate in the historical uh, dates and events? Yes, the big ones, yes. Um, all the dates in this novel coincide with his, historical fact. I did make up some characters. Arvilla Bunn, the woman she befriends in the first mining camp, is made up. Tommy Birdsall, the head of the mine, is made up. Um, and as you said, conversations, certainly. But yes, I felt that I had to stick to the known facts. Okay. Do you feel that you have to um, educate your reader as to what is true and what is fiction? Or do you just let it happen? Um, I, I mostly just let it happen. I, I did put some notes in the back of the book about things that, um, but not everything. You're not compelled to be accurate. No, and actually when I first started writing the novel I thought, oh this will be so easy because I have all of these events in her mm -hmm. life, but it needed an, a narrative arc to be a novel and I couldn't just follow all the events in her life. And in fact, there are major parts of her life that I didn't even include at all. So, um, actually, just one, one, one other relationship that she had that I didn't include. Um, but, but uh, no, I think I think you have to. And also, I think when I first started writing, I was very, very, I was doing very in-depth research, and I have boxes and boxes of material and. 
I went many times to Denver and Leadville. And as I wrote, I learned that, no, I don't need a whole page to describe the dresser in their bedroom. That's not what Lizzie would notice. I had to inhabit her as a, as a person, as a mm -hmm. character more, and, and not, not inundate the reader with too much historical research. Well, isn't that also part of the role of the editor? To help you see what works and what is, yes, yeah, you know, overbearing. Yes, yes. Um, now, do you? At what point do you find your publisher? Do you well, I had a long journey on this. As I said, it won this wonderfully prestigious award, and I think that was 1998. And then the. Um, had agents interested and very foolishly didn't follow up because we were in the midst of a move and I just didn't at the time. So, um, and always thought I'd come back to it. And then I had an agent, uh, a top agent at William Morris who loved it and said, you're going to be on Oprah, you're going to get $250,000 advance, et cetera, et cetera. And I was, Great. And she sent it out to 16 publishers, um, one of whom Crown was very interested, but they were waiting for a new publisher to come in. And that new publisher didn't want to make, an editor wanted to make a contract offer, but the new publisher did not. So I took it back from that agent and, and kept it for about two years and really did a significant rewrite on it um, based on what the publishers had mentioned. Mm -hmm. And then I decided I really wanted to get the book out there. And I didn't want to try to find an agent for it again. And I went with a small press called Serving House Books that's based in New Jersey and Copenhagen. And they did a beautiful job. They let me um, do the cover, and they were fabulous every step of the way. Um, so I'm happy that I did that. Yes. Well, I mean, a lot of writers don't have that option or, or aren't able to find a publisher. And right. So you've got to write the whole book and then right. try and to Right. And I didn't market want it. to self-publish, although certainly self-publishing is a valid option for people mm -hmm. these days. But I did want to have a, a traditional publisher. Why did you think this was a story that needed to be told? Because I think... You know, as I mentioned, so much of it resonates with our lives today. Um, both the political uncertainty, mm -hmm. the econ the financial uncertainty, um, and also I think I think you know we've seen in this country in the last ten years or so people with great wealth suddenly losing it, and what's left, and how do we build our lives? You know, I think in some ways we're learning as a as a culture that that. Building our lives on on f monetary wealth is not necessarily the most solid ground to stand on. Well, certainly, Baby Doe is an example of someone who survived loss. Yes, in yes. fact, I mean, her end of life, of course, is tragic. We have only a minute left, and I know that you also uh, publish or edit a journal. Yes. Tiferet Journal. Yes. In 50 words or less, tell me about it. We're a, it's a multi-faith literary journal. We publish authors from all faiths. I have a Jewish dad and a Christian mom, so I grew up thinking we all need to get along. And our mission is to promote tolerance through literature and art. Okay. And how does one find the journal? It's on the web, Tiferet, T-I-F-E-R-E-T, -E -E journal all one word, dot com. Okay. Is it published in hard copy as well? We have one print issue and three digital issues a year. Okay. So you can yeah. subscribe if yes, you wish. Yes, we would love. Online. Yes. Interesting. Donna, thank you so much for being my thank guest. Thank you, Alice. It's been a pleasure. It really has. And I've learned an awful lot. And I hope you have too. So on behalf of LMC TV and myself, thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time.